Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Big show, wonderful topic to cover today with Father McGilvery, who is a priest of the Society of St. Pius X, stationed in Quebec. We did have the pleasure of having Father McGilvery um, at our priory for about three years and uh, had the pleasure of sitting through third order meetings, catechism sessions, and so forth. Uh, perhaps you've seen him on the SSPX podcast, which he's been on a number of times. And Father was on an atheist podcast talking about Thomism or something. That was interesting. Sure. Yeah, that was good. Uh, anyway, Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on today. Sure, it's a pleasure, Kennedy. In, in fact, um, even though I'm stationed in Quebec right now, I have a number of parishioners who listen regularly to your own podcast. Um, there's a lot of people who are fully bilingual. And so uh, well, you oftentimes your... I get updates on you via my parishioners. So that's, that's well, you fun. need to tell your parishioners to get a better hobby because there's better things to do than waste your <laughs> time with my show. Um, no, but that podcast you did uh, on that atheist, did, did, did the atheist guy just kind of reach out and just want to talk to us kind of a smart Thomas? Was that how it worked? Um, yeah, it was, um, he has some kind of a coordinator who, um, finds people for him to talk to. And he reached out to, I think the, the district of Canada asking mm -hmm. to speak to an SSPX priest, because I guess we have a reputation for being pretty strict Thomas and Thomism is an intellectually rigorous form of, of Catholicism, obviously. So, uh, um, I think he was just looking for a, uh, a solid opponent, I suppose. My favorite part was when he brought you, I think you guys were talking about essences and he brought up Klingonness, like Klingons. <laughs> and you said, I'm, you mean like when something clings on to your clothing, like a burr and you said, and he said, no, like Klingons. <laughs> he said, I'm not familiar with this. I just thought that was, it was such a manifestation of the debate. This guy is in sci-fi yeah. land and yeah, anyway. Yeah. That was uh, I, after that. I just felt like it's it's hard to describe the feeling, but you really feel like you've been talking for two hours to someone from a completely different universe. With just, it's amazing the intellectual gap. Um, and I mean, he's a very smart guy, so it's not that he's stupid. He's very smart. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's just so little that we have in common that it's very hard to have a productive conversation. <laughs> well, that that's a segue perfectly into what we're going to talk about because we're going to talk about yeah. modernism and. A lot of people have no idea what modernism is, even traditionalists. Now, I did just release an article. We're recording this on a Friday. I think it'll be up in the next couple of days. But um, I did release an article today with uh, Crisis Magazine about the death and resurrection of the Catholic sense. And my, mm -hmm. my point of the article was basically following all this World Youth Day silliness. Um, you know, you kind of see it or you don't. You have this Catholic sense. You go, yeah, technically, I guess they put the Eucharistic container inside of the plastic thing, but like, this is stupid. We just shouldn't do this. You know, there's, or mm. you, you either see it or you don't. It's your Catholic sense. So a lot of people, they have this Catholic sense and they say, something's wrong. Um, I don't like the new mass. Uh, you know, the, the, the new catechism seems ambiguous here and there, you know, various things. And they kind of say, well, modernism is that thing that's just kind of popular right now, but it's really much more than that. Modernism is a philosophical doctrinal outlook. It is a, it is a sophisticated system. And we're going to go through today, Pashendi, or at least parts of it, which was written by Pope Pius X uh, about 115 years ago at this point. Yeah. Okay. So first question, father, what is modernism? Before we continue, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to show you this beautiful rosary from, uh, sent to me by one of our sponsors, Queen of Victory Rosaries on Etsy. You can find her stuff here. I'll just show you. And uh, it's absolutely wonderful stuff. You can find here a variety of um, beautiful, handmade, very durable. Um, I have one of those rugged rosaries, which is awesome and lasts forever, um, but it is a bit cumbersome to carry around. It kind of makes this big ball in your pocket. Whereas this, because it's sort of got that beautiful classic rosary chain sort of thing, it's, um, it's very sleek and easy to bring, but it does have very strong chain to it. So I'm not worried about my kids ripping it apart. And, um, Queen of Victory does make custom rosaries as well. So if we look at their stuff here, you can find, um, uh, various types, different chaplets, and so on and so forth, single decades. And if you do message 
the woman who runs Queen of Victory through her Etsy store. She can make you a custom rosary as well. In addition, um, if they break down for normal wear and tear, you know, don't use it to try to pull your car out of a ditch. But if it just breaks, you know, through general usage, you send it back and she'll fix it for you. You can use the name Kennedy at checkout and get a discount on your orders. The links for these products are in the description to this video. Thank you, Queen of Victory Rosaries, for sponsoring this video. Now back to the show. Okay. Well, it's uh, not easy to find a definition of it. In fact, I, I believe that if you read carefully through Pashendi, you'll find um, a description of many of its characteristics, but nowhere is there a line saying modernism is and giving some kind of an essential definition. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure that that there would be conflicting opinions, but I've um, tried to come up with a definition, which I think is pretty satisfactory. Um, so at core modernism, it's an attempt to reconcile the Catholic faith with um, some core beliefs of modern philosophy, um, which is uh, essentially uh, subjectivist and agnostic. Um, modern philosophy denies the possibility of knowing um, the nature of external reality and uh, especially of passing from external reality, the things around us, to knowledge of a creator by the principle of causality. Um, and so because modern philosophy um, basically shuts off all of that, um, says that it's impossible, um, as a result, the only way to attain to some kind of a relationship with God and to practice religion is if religion, faith, dogma, all of that comes from the interior. Um, so those are consequences of modern philosophy. Um, and modernism is the attempt to embrace modern philosophy and incorporate it, incorporate it into the Catholic faith um, with the consequence that the notion itself of faith, of revelation, and of dogma is corrupted. Um, and the end result is that faith um, and revelation become simply personal religious experience, um, which you may you know, live in a communal setting, but it's still something personal inside of you, uh, an experience. And uh, dogma is just, uh, it's a kind of symbolism. It's a way of expressing to yourself and to others your intimate religious experience. Um, but the value of dogma, of dogmatic formulas, is purely relative. It's a temporary way of manifesting um, religious experience, which has to change and adapt with the times. Excellent. Yeah. And um, I tried to put a definition of modernism on the screen there, but my font was good. I'll probably just add that in post. But basically, sure. it comes down to these three pillars, essentially. You have agnosticism, mm -hmm. you have the evolution of dogma, and you have vital imminence. Perhaps yes. we could break down those three pillars because uh, people hear the word agnosticism and they think, oh, that just means people who aren't really sure if there's a God. Well, mm -hmm. before you even get to that place, there's already an agnosticism in the philosophical perspective. Um, Yes. And then with evolution of dogma, is that the same thing as dogma is being clarified over time? Is it the same thing as, as uh, d um, the, the uh, development of dogma, which we do see, you know, the, sure. bef before, before transubstantiation is dogmatized per se, there is belief in the real presence. And then there's sort of a, a growing in the understanding and the precision mm -hmm. of how to explain that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then vital imminence, I, people probably don't even know what that word means. So I think maybe we should break these down. So perhaps we could start with agnosticism, Father. Sure. So, right, agnosticism, um, one of its conclusions is that we can't know if God exists or not, at least not with a, an absolute and objective certainty. Um, but agnosticism as um, a kind of aspect of modern philosophy, it, it's, it's um, more all-encompassing. Uh, it's, it's something broader than just uh, calling into doubt God's existence. Um, because, in fact, modern philosophy has a tendency to deny the possibility of knowing the nature of things outside of us. Um, so the one core certitude of modern philosophy, starting with uh, René Descartes um, mm -hmm. in the 16th century, is that um, basically we only know ourselves and our own ideas, our own impressions of things. Um, the, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Descartes' famous saying that I think, therefore I am. Um, so. Descartes, he identified as the, the one thing which is immediately evident to him as, as true, um, his own consciousness, his own thoughts and impressions. That's all that he knows as, as kind of a first principle. 
Um, and then he wants to found all human knowledge upon that. And so if I can't make a bridge somehow um, from my self-consciousness to the world outside of me, then I don't really know if that world exists um, or if it's just, you know, some kind of product of my own consciousness, which which has no correspondence to an external reality. Um, and so we should, we should also yeah, add, though, Father, ahead. quickly, um, mm -hmm. when you look up Rene Descartes, mm -hmm. there are some who do an apologetic form as himself personally being a very faithful Catholic. And he may very well have been. I mean, yes. I, I don't I don't know too much. He, he could have. I hope he's in heaven. I hope I hope everybody makes it to heaven. I hope he died with the sacraments and state of grace. I mean, that'd be that's the, that's the point. Um, but his ph philosophical revolution, let's call it, even if the consequences maybe he didn't personally feel when he felt them, when he when he made it, this revolution, maybe it wasn't even immediate in the world of philosophy. But this cogito ergo sum, this I think, therefore I am, it did have the effect of essentially flipping the order of philosophy. We contrast that, for example, with. Uh, St. Augustine. Um, St. Augustine, one of his famous lines from the confession is, I think, I believe that I may understand, meaning he actually accepts as an axiomatic presupposition that understanding is possible because truth is outside of him, and then he can go to understand it. And then you go to Descartes, and it's, I'm actually going to start with me as the barometer of the fact that things even exist, and then I can understand them through myself as the instrument. This is, the, mm -hmm. this is a complete flip, which he may not have seen. So if you look up Descartes, and yeah, he's a faithful Catholic, fine, I hope he was, but his ideas had consequences. Yes, exactly. Um, that, that, that is correct, that he always continued to identify as, as a Catholic and to say that he held the Catholic faith. Um, but what we see, and this is, this is a major problem, is that not every philosophy is objectively compatible with the Catholic faith. And you have people who, in trying to philosophize, establish false principles that of themselves would tend to undermine the entire structure of the faith. Um, but because they don't want that to happen, they, they, they intend to remain faithful to the church's teaching, um, they, they find some dubious way of reconciling the two. But then yes. other people come along who are perhaps you know more logically rigorous um, in, in deducing conclusions from this principle that that a apparently good Catholic has set up before them. Um, and they say, okay, so, you know, Descartes was correct um, to, uh, you know, base all knowledge upon uh, one's own consciousness and one's own ideas upon the self. Um, but it logically follows from that, that we can't know about external reality. We can't know that God exists. And Descartes, uh, you know, would have and did uh, vehemently deny all of those conclusions. Um, but in fact, they, they can be shown to follow logically from his premises. So he, he established some very bad premises um, because of his personal faith. He didn't take them to their logical conclusion, but others did so later. And so we were able to see with the unfolding of history just how, how rotten were the, the fundamental presuppositions of, of Descartes' philosophy. Yes, excellent. So this is kind of the beginning of agnosticism. We see this uh, turned into actual schools of philosophy with... Kant and Hegel. Um, yes, yes. I think if there was a way, if, if you could, if you, in my opinion, if, if someone could say, what is modernism? I would basically say it's Hegelian philosophy, even more than Kantian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and so maybe we can unpack what, what is, what is Kantianism and what is uh, Hegelian philosophy? Just briefly. Sure. Yeah. Gladly. Um, so Kant, um, basically he agrees with Descartes, that we have to start from the knowledge of our own uh, self, our own ideas. In fact, it's a little bit, uh, just as a parenthesis briefly, it's a little bit complicated because, in fact, Descartes and, um, and um, Kant and the others, it's very radical what they say. They don't even necessarily believe in, in a self in the sense of some underlying substance which thinks. For Descartes um, and other philosophers following him, um, you are your own consciousness. You are your own stream or series of thoughts. And that's so that's really all that you know. So in other words, I know that I'm thinking. I know that I have thoughts and impressions. Um, and I can't go, uh, let's say, above those impressions or outside of them into the, into the real external world. I can't make that jump. Um, but also, I can't go deeper um, than my own thoughts to conclude that I am a thinking subject. I am a certain substance which exists and which has thoughts. I'm really just stuck at the level of my thoughts and impressions. And that's, that's as far as I can, as I can go um, in, mm -hmm. in 
really understanding the nature of things. Um, and so many modern philosophers tend to say that, you know, you are your own thoughts. It's a very bizarre yes. and counterintuitive idea. Um, okay, all that is just as a little parenthesis. Now, now um, Kant, um, he accepted um, the reality of an external world. Um, I, I don't know enough about Kant's philosophy to say how he tried to bridge the gap there. Um, but he at least accepted that there, there is some kind of external reality um, that we perceive in some way through the senses. Um, but in the act of perceiving external reality, we, we disfigure it. We impose our own um, uh, intuitions and categories of thought upon reality. Um, so, for example, the very notions of space and time, obviously, we, we perceive all physical objects as being in three dimensional space. And then there is a, a series of, of changes which we measure by time. Um, and for Kant, um, space and time are simply um, intuitions that we impose upon kind of the raw data coming in through our senses. Um, right. And so time is not a real thing. Space is not a real thing. It's, it's our own subjective category. Um, in fact, sometimes Kant's philosophy is called a kind of, um, I might be getting the term wrong here, but some kind of cognitive hylomorphism. Um, hylomorphism is the idea that um, reality is composed of matter and form. This is an Aristotelian uh, classical philosophical concept. Aristotle says that everything material has, has matter, which is kind of formless and unknowable in itself. And then it's what it is, is determined by its form, its substantial form. Um, so a tree has the form of a tree, a dog has the form of a dog, etc. Um, and, you know, wood, for example, can become a different substance, ashes, by a substantial change. And what happens there is that you have the same underlying matter, but before you have one substantial form, and then after you have another. Uh, you have the form of wood, then you have the form of ashes. Um, that substantial change, that's, that's Aristotelian hylomorphism. Yep. Um, now, Kant, he has his own form of hylomorphism in regard to human knowledge. He says that um, the external world, it's like matter, um, which is in itself unknowable. And then what we do is we impose our own forms of thought upon the external world um, to, to create what, what is our, our phenomena or our, our subjective experience. It's like this, this um, fusion or, um, or composite resulting from subjective categories or ways of thinking and objective stuff. Um, so as I already yeah. mentioned, space and time, those are our kinds of forms that we impose on, on reality, but also other things like substance. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that there are underlying subjects to uh, phenomena, um, like I am a certain subject, which is underlying my thoughts and other activities. There's something permanent there, uh, which is at the base of, of my individual reality. Um, but everything, uh, you know, I see um, a, a desk in front of me or a computer or whatever. Um, and there's color there, there's shape, there's, you know, maybe sound coming from the object. If I strike it, all those are external, um, appearances or phenomena. Um, and sound philosophy would say that underlying the appearances, the phenomena, there is a substance, there is a being which, yes. which is, is there and which is primary. And then all the other things are added on top like layers. Um, and so, uh, for, for Kant, uh, substance is itself just a, a category of thought, a way of thinking, causality as well. Um, all that we can know is that there is a certain series of events. If, I, if I'm playing pool, um, maybe I strike one billiard ball and it rolls and then it hits another one and the other one starts moving. Um, and for uh, Kant and other philosophers of his time, um, all that I can know is the fact of, of succession. One thing happens, one phenomena succeeds another but that there's actually a, a causal link between the two. I can't perceive that with my eyes. Um, mm -hmm. That's not in my sense data. And so that too is just a category that I, I impose upon reality. Um, so the end result is that according to Kant, um, our experience of reality is, this, this is the result of a fusion of what is really there outside of us and our own um, way of thinking. And we can never untangle the two. We can never know what would reality be like if I took away my own uh, intuitions and categories of thought. Um, that rests unknowable. It's the, the noumenon, as, uh, as he says, um, uh, as opposed to the phenomenon, which is, which is my subjective impression. I know my impression. I know the phenomenon. But I can't ever know the noumenon, the thing in itself, um, because in order to know it, I have to impose my own subjective way of thinking upon it. 
this sort of dilemma is reconciled. I was just reading some Aquinas last night. Um, I have, uh, it's by Penguin, it's by Penguin Books. It's just a selected writings of Thomas Aquinas. It's a mm-hmm. bunch of stuff from his whole career and uh, his discussion on prime matter. And he resolves a lot of these issues with basically, you go back to this idea about um, wood can become ashes. But even there, Aquinas, I think, unless I'm understanding it wrong, the matter itself would actually have form to it because it can only it can only be part of certain substances, essentially. Um, mm. uh, and this was a discussion basically based on the creation. So a lot of these things are kind of reconciled by good tr- traditional scholastic philosophy. Mm-hmm. And but the problem is is that these types of ideas by Kant and we'll talk about Hegel in a second here. And actually, before I before you continue with Hegel, I'll read um, just before we continue. Um, Kantianism condemned by Leo the Thirteenth and Pashendi, please, because yes. you gave me those notes. But yep. these the, these philosophies make you a schizophrenic. They make you they make you um, you know like the modern philosopher today who is a Kantian because virtually all of them are Kantian or, or Hegelian. They're relativists basically. He teaches his students that there's no such thing as coffee, and that you don't exist, and that thirst is a, an illusion or whatever. Yep. But he gets up every morning and he really needs a real coffee. Um, yes. And it's very difficult to argue these things with people uh, because they they look at it almost as like a a sick joke, you know? It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. So we really don't know anything. Isn't this stupid? Which, if you follow these philosophies all the way, you do get to someone like Jean-Paul Sartre or Camus, these French mm-hmm. atheist philosophers, who they're asking the question, and 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 Sartre said the only question left in philosophy was why not suicide. Um, because, no. because it really does, it pulls the entire meaning out of existence, which you're fighting against every day because everything does have real meaning to you in your real life, but you've convinced yourself that it's not even real to begin with. I remember when I was little, maybe this, maybe this was a foreshadow for me being such a nerd when I grew up, but, um, I was sitting, I, I was in like grade three or four and someone said something about the desk in the classroom. Maybe they heard it from their brother, parents or something. Well, there's really no such thing as a desk. What there are is tiny particles that are moving at microscopic s- sizes and infinitely fast. You can't even see it and you experience it as material. I remember this. I remember thinking yeah. to myself, that's insane. I remember sitting, waiting for the school bus and I got like, St. Thomas or St. Augustine would say cogitating. I was like just really thinking about it. And I got into this world and I went, this is really depressing. I don't know. It was just this yes. intuition yeah. I had and I didn't want to think about it again, but that's, that's the modern philosopher. It is a yeah. philosophy of nihilism essentially. Yeah. And the, as you say, there's, there's obviously this huge divide between what people believe theoretically on the basis of modern philosophy and then their day-to-day life. I mean, um, you take a, a typical materialist um, who believes that everything is uh, all objects and even living beings are just fancy collections of, of atoms of little particles moving around with no inherent purpose. Um, and then he goes home at the end of the day and, and greets his wife and says, hi, honey, I love you and gives her a kiss. What are you doing? Kissing a bundle of particles? It's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's the thing is fundamentally there. I mean, uh, there, obviously their degrees of moral responsibility will vary from one person to another, mm-hmm. but they, they're living a, a life of hypocr- hypocrisy. Um, Catholicism yes. is a worldview where um, the theoretical understanding of reality and the way of living, they actually can correspond very well. Uh, and mm-hmm. to the extent that they don't, you take personal responsibility. You're a sinner. I failed to live according to my beliefs. But um, and someone who, who embraces modern philosophy is really compelled to live according to his, uh, uh, um, live contrary to his beliefs at each and every moment because mm-hmm. it's really uh, it's God or the gun. And people know that, that suicide is, is wrong, uh, unrealistic, uh, pardon, I'm sorry, uh, is, uh, uh, unreasonable. Um, they know that, um, you know, our, our basic instincts to seek nourishment, uh, uh, pleasure, recreation, um, there's something natural about them in, in and of themselves are good and should be followed. And, and so even though their ideology would, would make all of that meaningless. They nevertheless continue to just follow their instincts, uh, very much like like animals, you know, just yeah. kind of blindly feeling their way. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, before you read the, those um, those con- condemnations of Kantianism, um, I sure. wanted to kind of tag along an observation to um, or tack on a, an observation to what you said, um, because we um, we've explained 
Kant's um, worldview in general or globally. But as you said, um, you know, people often don't want to um, carry out the logical consequences of their worldview because they see that the practical uh, result would be disastrous. And mm -hmm. Kant was, uh, so he, he grew up in a pious Protestant family um, in, in Prussia, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And he um, did not want to abandon uh, religion and morality altogether. So he found a way to accommodate that to his philosophical framework. And that way of accommodating or reconciling the two is imitated by modernism. So I think mm -hmm. to fully understand the influence of Kantianism on modernism and, and how it's, it's there as kind of a pre, uh, presupposition, it's important to see how Kant reconciled uh, his, his philosophy, his, especially his epistemology, his theory of knowledge um, with the existence of God. Um, and, and effectively what Kant said was, um, uh, because we can't know external reality, we can't reason with objective certitude to the existence of God. And nevertheless, the idea of God is of great practical value um, for living a moral life, um, particularly because um, we, we just have this sense that those who do right should be rewarded, those who do wrong should be punished. Um, and so for Kant, uh, this kind of argument, it wasn't sufficient to generate uh, objective certainty for him that God exists. But but Kant basically said that, you know, we should all act like God exists. Um, we should all have a certain practical certitude, um, which comes from this, this need that we feel uh, that there be a, a divine being that rewards and punishes. Um, and yeah, God, so, is, God is the babysitter that we need to think is there yeah. so we don't steal our brother's uh, video games or whatever. Yeah, yeah, effectively. Yeah. And in religion for him as well was was not necessarily something true, except with a practical truth. That is, it's it's useful for living an upright life. And so he said, you know, all the, the different historical religions, um, none of them is objectively verifiable as, as true, um, but they all have a certain core, which is that they, they help to give us a sense of of God as as a divine being that guarantees the the moral uh, the moral order, he's not the source of yeah. the moral order according to Kant, but he is there to to um, reward the good and punish the evil. Well, I mean, it's you know as much as people like Jordan Peterson, and he definitely says a lot of good things. You see this modernist Kantian philosophy in men like him uh, because they get yeah. into this union idea of the archetypes. You know, yeah. uh, God is sort of the over over time. Um, man has evolved to understand that there are certain principles that are so important that they themselves almost exist independent of man uh, by reason of necessity for the for the progress of man towards the omega point basically sounds like chardin and then you know this is who god is you know he is the archetype of the necessity for the father who is the rule giver and the merciful one and the justice and all these kinds of things. And if people don't act in accordance with this archetype, then human race, the human society descends into chaos, which is blah, blah, blah in the old myths. I mean, this is these, these, philosoph these philosophies by men like Peterson and others. And again, I like Peterson as far as it goes. I mean, he said a lot of really great things, especially as a Canadian, he stood up to the Trudeau nonsense, but, but the philosophical basis is not scholastic in men like that. And it's much more like Kantianism. For sure, yeah, I, I fully agree. Yeah, um, can I add one more thing before <laughs> before you pull yeah, sure. up the text? Um, it's just that um, so so now that we've established this, um, uh, when we apply it to the domain of of uh, Christianity and the Catholic faith, when modernists do this, um, they're going to do something similar to what Kant does with with external reality in general, where there's some kind of raw data, and then you apply subjective forms. Um, mm -hmm. And that that results in your experience, your personal experience of reality. Um, for Kant, you know, he's talking about uh, physical external things, and then you, you apply categories of space, time, uh, mm -hmm. causality, substance. Um, now, what what happens in modernism is that instead, um, for example, you have the external data concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a certain historical person, um, and then what happens in um, religious religious experience is that you end up projecting um your own um kind of uh desires and aspirations upon this historical person 
And the result is that this historical character is transfigured um, mm-hmm. and becomes, you know, the Christ of faith. Um, but this idea that there's there's two Christs, the Christ of um, of history, who's a mere man, and then the Christ of faith, who's been transfigured by the the, the subjective uh, beliefs of of uh, of believers, um, it's it's exactly or almost exactly parable, parallel to this idea of Kant um, that you have uh, two realities. You have the uh, noumena, the things as they are in themselves, which are which are unknowable. And then you have uh, the projection of subjective categories of thought onto the noumena, um, which, which, uh, or onto, onto your <laughs> experience of the noumena, and the result is the phenomena. Um, but anyways, that, that's, no, that's all good. I wanted to add for now. Okay, let's read. I'll read. Uh, there is from Leo the Thirteenth, but I'm just going to read from Pushendi by Pius the, the uh, Tenth sure. because we're going through the the, the meat of that document. And this is what yep. um, it's not named by name, um, and this is yep. common in um, Catholic history. You know, you see with whoever whoever Augustine was writing against one of the heretics, and he just calls him his critic, his opponent, things like that. And the reason is too is because you also it's kind of like with serial killers, you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to encourage any copycats. You know, you, you attack the ideas. You don't want people to try to act like them. So, you know, you attack the ideas and then people recognize those ideas. And there's a very important aspect to this as well, because a lot of the time, like, for example, I'm thinking in my mind of 15 different Catholic apostolates that are very conservative that I know are full with modernism. And I could name them all in my head right now. But a lot of people have allegiances to those places. And if I were to do that, they wouldn't listen to me. Or they wouldn't listen to you, more importantly. So mm-hmm. instead, we talk about the ideas, and then they can recognize it. So here's um, what it says in Pashendi about what is essentially Kantianism. It says, Modernists place the foundation of religious philosophy in that doctrine which is commonly called agnosticism. According to this teaching, human reason is confined entirely within the field of phenomena, that is to say, to things that appear and in the manner in which they appear. It has neither the right nor the power to overstep these limits. Hence, it is incapable of lifting itself up to God and of recognizing his existence, even by means of visible things. From this, it is interfered, inferred, excuse me, that God can never be the direct object of science, and that as regards history, he must not be considered an historical subject. According to modernists, science and history are confined within two boundaries, the one external, namely the visible world, the other internal, which is consciousness. When one or other of these limits has been reached, there can be no further progress, for beyond is the unknowable. In the presence of this unknowable, whether it is outside man and beyond the visible world of nature or lies hidden within the subconsciousness, the need of the divine in a soul, which is prone to religious excites, a religion excites, excuse me, according to the principles of fideism, so an overemphasis on faith without reason, without any previous ad, uh, advertence of the mind, a certain special sense, and this sense possesses implied within itself both as its own object and as its intrinsic cause, the divine reality itself, and in a way unites man with God. It is in this sense to which modernists give the name of faith, and this is what they hold to be the beginning of religion. Translation, we have within us a religious impulse that we can't really explain because we we can't really know God for sure, but because we all have it, we follow that thing to get what we think is the ineffable nature of God. This type of Kantian heresy is not very common in the conservative Catholic world today. You will see this with men like Father James Martin. I think he literally just said in an interview at World Youth Day, it was something to the effect of, well, we can't actually know God exists for certain kind of thing. And I'm just like, okay, anyway. Um, But we'll get into neo-modernism later in in the show. But the separation of the material and the spiritual as if they're different realms to be studied under different almost uh, uh, cat, almost different uh, mechanisms or different modes of knowing. This is very common in even conservative Catholicism today. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so Hegel. Let's briefly touch upon Hegel because I think he's the other most important po- philosopher besides Darwin when it comes to modernism. For sure. Okay, um, yep. So Hegel is a German philosopher um, uh, who came shortly after Kant and was strongly influenced by Kant. Um, but unlike Kant, who continued to recognize, uh, in theory, a, an external deity, an external god, uh, Hegel tended rather to identify the divine with the universe itself, um, which is in an unending, unending uh, progression or evolution towards uh, a more and more perfect state of being. 
Um, and this happens through a series of, of steps, which repeat themselves, um, where there is kind of the existing state of things called the thesis. And then you have an opposing force, uh, which is the antithesis. Um, and the two clash, they come into conflict. And then uh, a new status quo emerges from the conflict. And that, that um, union of the two um, forged by their conflict is called the synthesis. Mm -hmm. And the synthesis is always superior to what came before it. Um, so you have this unending progression of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Um, and in this way, um, the, the universe evolves by its own internal dynamic uh, towards greater and greater perfection. Essentially, the, the universe becomes God. It's a kind mm -hmm. of ascending pantheism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this, well, it's yin and yang, basically, if you've put it yeah. in the Eastern stuff. And, sure. um, and this has been manifest within the church. Uh, actually, I'm thinking of the address that pa Paul VI gave in 1969 on the eve of uh, implementing the Novus Ordo. He basically said, the Novus Ordo is probably going to be a disaster because it gets rid of all of these old traditions, which we love and are amazing and Catholic and wonderful, but we need to have it in the vernacular. So there's this implicit because the need of prayer and the modern language or whatever is so important. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like he's saying, we do have to mix oil and water here because it's more important that we get what comes from the oil and water. That's pretty much sure. the basis for it. And, um, you know, this is, think of the compromises in the liturgy. It's like, well, we need to bring in secular music into the holy place, even though holy rejects the, sac the secular and secular is not fitting for the holy place. But if we do that and we mix these opposites, then we'll get the modern Catholic, basically. These are Hegelian yes. views that are on display in the church writ large. Absolutely. If I can add to that, um, I, I mean, we see that a little bit with uh, Pope John the Twenty uh, Third, um, who at the start of the council opens up the window as a symbolic gesture to say, you know, the, we have kind of stale air in the church right now. We need to let in fresh, fresh air from the, the external world. Um, and it's this idea that yes, um, maybe the the church as it's been until now is a kind of thesis, and then the world we need to let in some opposition from the world. Uh, which serves as an antithesis to produce some kind of a higher synthesis. Yeah. Um, I know that Benedict the Sixteenth as well used that language of thesis antithesis synthesis. Um, I, I don't know his writings well enough to quote something off at the top of my head. Um, I, I do know that um, well. His idea of the reform of the reform, returning to the liturgy, is very much Hegelian in the sense that um, uh, the traditional mass was the thesis. The new mass is the antithesis, and yes. then they will mutually enrich each other to res to produce the resulting synthesis. The her Father, the hermen hermeneutic of continuity is Hegelianism mm -hmm. par excellence. It right, is right. Um, these things are contrary to each other. We need to interpret them in light of each other, and then we'll get the real thing through them, which is impossible. Yeah. It's yeah. impossible. Um, and ironically, I was thinking about this earlier. Side note. Um, People should be thanking the SSPX if they like the hermeneutic of continuity, because there would have been no nothing to have continuity with if it wasn't for Archbishop Lefebvre saving it. So there you go, another, <laughs> another win for Archbishop Lefebvre. Okay, so uh, let's move on to um, imminence and evolution of dogma. I think um, evolution of dogma, I think, is probably the easiest for people to understand. Yeah. Basically, things change, therefore dogma has to change. You know, That's explicit sure. modernism. And we'll talk maybe in a bit, we'll talk after imminence about um, how th no one really dares to be an actual evolver of dogma today. I mean, this is condemned by Pius X in 1907. So from after that, the modernists kind of have to go underground and change their tune. No one's really, no one really in their right mind, even, even a guy like Father James Martin, he doesn't, as much as he is, dis dis his ideas are to be despised, he doesn't actually... He's very, I mean, he's a Jesuit. Jesuits are, you know, the corruption of the best is the worst. You know, a, a bad Jesuit is the worst thing possible. And, um, you know, he doesn't technically cross the line on some of his things. He's very cunning. Um, he, he won't actually come out and say, church teaching per se ought to be changed. He'll explain it in a way. But at this time, there was the evolution of dogma, which we don't really see anymore. But imminence, imminence is, is, a, is a tricky one for people. Can you explain that for us, please? 
Yes. So uh, to begin with, it's kind of like the religious parallel of Kant's idea of projecting subjective uh, categories of thought upon the external world. Um, but in this case, um, it's rather a, a religious sense um, inside of man. Uh, when it's confronted with the unknown, um, it's looking at some phenomena. Maybe it's the person of Christ in history. Maybe it's something else. And there seems to be something that transcends, um, you know, for example, in, in Christ, what is typical of a normal man. Christ seems to have more wisdom. Um, he seems to have insights that no man has ever had. And you ask yourself, well, how is that possible? Um, and then uh, without having any proof in the strict sense that he was God, um, the, the religious sense feels a need to affirm it. Um, and so when that results in the affirmation Christ is God without really having a, a rational basis um, other than this, this internal need, this sense that, you know, this satisfies my longing for a religious experience. Yeah. Um, and, and basically it's, it's the only way to keep some kind of, uh, you know, um, very distorted version of faith after you have um, laid down the principle of agnosticism. Agnosticism has as an immediate consequence that we can't receive revelation from the outside. We can't learn, um, you know, from a, an apostle, from from one of the successors of the apostles, um, a, a certain faith content, a message that, you know, um, Jesus Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity made man. He died for our sins, all of that. Um, that, that presupposes that I can know external reality um, and that I can become certain of, of the ex existence of God, of the possibility of miracles, that uh, there can be satisfactory historical evidence that Christ worked miracles and demonstrated his claims. All of that is is taking as a, as a presupposition that I can know external reality. But once I, I posit the principle of agnosticism, um, just I've already ruled out the very possibility of doing apologetics in a, in a traditional way and of concluding in a rational way to, to the existence of God, to the divinity of Jesus Christ, to the divine institution of the Catholic Church. Um, um, all of that is, is it cannot be um, demonstrated or even supported rationally. Um, and so the only way to get there, the only way to maintain my allegiance to, to the Catholic faith in, in, in the case of modernists um, is for me to establish some way of getting there from the inside. It has to be um, um, that I find this revelation somehow written already in my heart, so to speak. Yep. Um, and it's just in reading my own sentiments and my own aspirations that I find the faith already there. Um, it's something that I discover inside of me. And that's what's called vital influence. Yeah, I'll read here a quick sentence from Pashendi. This is paragraph 10. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, look up the encyclical Pashendi. It's spelled P-A-S-C-A-C-E-N-D-I. Dominici Gregis, D-O-M-I-N-I-C-I. -I -I, Gregis, G-R-E-G-I-S. I'll, I'll try to remember to put it in the notes for the show. Um, you can read it yourself. It is very dense. You have to read it 20, 30, 40, 180 times in order to understand it fully. Um, it has a lot of philosophical language. If you don't know the terms, you'll have to know the terms beforehand. So, uh, But anyway, paragraph 10 says, It is thus that the religious sense, which through the agency of vital imminence, emerges from the lurking places of the subconscious, some consciousness. It is the germ of all religion and the explanation of everything that has been or ever will be in any religion. So if you look, if you do a control F search on this document online, you'll find vital imminence all over the place. This leads to various consequences. And I was thinking as you were, as you were saying this, so first, first is necessary some sort of agnosticism. So once you tell yourself, I can't really know things, the problem is, is that you're a human being and you want to know things. So then if you can't know things externally, meaning that there are facts out there that exist that you submit to have hap having happened or existing despite your existence or, or not needing your existence. If you get rid of that principle, then now you have to know things through basically your own personal experience. And this is why it's vital imminent. It's imminent to you. And this plays on a principle that is kind of orthodox, but it perverts it. So Augustine, who I love Augustine, and he would say, God is more near to me than I am to myself, something like that. The modernists will take that and they'll run with it. They'll say, look, he was advocating. No, no, Augustine sees things. First of all, you have to read all of Augustine. Also, he was speaking as a Platonist and not as a, a Thomist. But, but furthermore, um, it is true that God is the center of our being, but he also is 
external from us. This is this is an, 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 an uh, metaphorical way of speaking about it. It doesn't mean that mm-hmm. Augustine is saying that we're like the Quakers and God is the light within us or something like that. Um, so, but when you follow vital imminence, though, now you have a couple of problems. One, how do you have religion without experience? Well, you can't. So how do you say other religions are false if they're having real experiences? Um, Islam, if it's true for a Muslim, they're having something that they say is a religious experience and they're telling the truth and they exist. I have no grounds to deny that. Um, And then in Catholicism, one of the most uh, pernicious examples of vital imminence, and this is going to offend some people, two examples. One is... Uh, apparition chasing, okay? People chase apparitions, private private apparitions of Our Lady, allegedly, in many places, and you know what they are. There's many of them. Um, They chase after these apparitions because they have to have a continual proof that the religious impulse is happening. They have to see the divine happening all the time because they have to feed the need to experience it. And this is what Christ warns us about when he says a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. If we're chasing after these things, we're going to go off our rocker. And the next place, which is usually tied into apparition chasing, is the charismatic renewal. Um, People need to have these continual signs where from within, they have the baptism of the Holy Ghost or whatever it's called, and they feel their religious impulse excited. And this is proof of their faith. And, when those, and the problem with these things is, is when those experiences die, the faith of the person dies with it. And I've seen it many times. Yep. No, very good observation. I, I fully agree with both of them. And those are two real dangers in our modern times. Um, I, I have known some charismatic Catholics even you know, before pursuing the priesthood. I had some high school friends who were charismatic. Um, and I just remember be, being struck by one who told me that... Um, you know, she she was persuaded that if you really loved Jesus, then every time you go to Holy Communion, you should feel like something burning inside of you. Your heart should beat like like you're in love with someone. Um, it, it's yeah. uh, it is so based upon the sentiments, the emotions. Um, yeah. So even if there's not some kind of like uh, direct ideological connection with with um, modernism in the sense that a charismatic Catholic wouldn't identify with with what's described in Pashendi. Nevertheless, there is a similar subjectivism and reliance upon the emotions, for sure. Well, for sure. And, and, we, and yeah, and, that's, and this is why it's so dangerous. And Pius X says somewhere in the later paragraphs, he says something like, um, ultimately, it's not possible to adopt one of the principle without adopting all of them. Um, this is true with, with uh, philosophy in general. If you start letting something in, eventually, I mean, it's like a little crack and there's a dam. Eventually, it's going to break open the whole thing. Many charismatic Catholics are, of course, very orthodox and conservative, um, and they seek to be good Catholics. But by participating in this vital, this vital imminence, basically activity or, or pursuit, Mm -hmm. it does, it breaks down your defenses because there's still going to be this lingering thing of, well, you know, I'll just pray about it. And okay. But even there, you know, you get into the weeds and then all of a sudden, anyway, that's a big problem. Okay. So that's vital (laughs) imminence. Now I'll read this. I'll read this. And then you can I'll, you can piggyback sure. off. But this is chapter th- or paragraph sure. thirteen, and he goes from vital how vital imminence leads to evolution of dogma. Okay. He says dogma is not only able but ought to evolve and to be changed. This is strongly affirmed by the modernists and clearly flows from their principles. For among the chief points of their teaching is the following, which they deduce from the principle of vital imminence, namely that religious formulas if they are to be really religious and not merely intellectual speculations, ought to be living, that reminds me of living tradition, they use that term today, living and to live the life of the religious sense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, for sure. Um, So exactly, to to begin with, if faith is primarily a subjective religious experience, then the way in which it's formulated is not all that important. That is to say, the formulation of religious belief only has value uh, in a relative sense, insofar as it serves to express uh, my my experience to myself and to others in the same community. Um, it, it really is a, a mere tool uh, that has a kind of symbolic value because no matter what I say in words, 
um, no proposition can really correspond to an experience. A religious experience in the in the ideology of of, of modernism um, is something of itself ineffable, um, and uh, so every dogmatic formula. Um, expresses perhaps a certain aspect of, of a genuine religious experience, but not the totality. And, and that lack of correspondence between the two is the reason why dogmas and, and religious formulas can change over time, um, because they're never adequate to begin with. Um, and right. so if something is only a partial reflection of the reality, um, then at another time, you can look at another reflection of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so you might say that, you know, God has not changed religion in its core has not changed, but our way of expressing it has changed because, um, you know, we just don't find the old dogmatic formulas well adapted to express um, our experience of the divine as it's happening right now. Um, the experience yeah. always transcends the formula. And so the formula has to be changed um, continually in order to reflect different facets of religious experience. Well, this is a, there's a, there's a sentence here from um, paragraph 26, which will say what you're saying. Yeah. And it says, but to them must be added those extraordinary men whom we call prophets of whom Christ was the greatest, both because in their lives um, and their words, there was something mysterious which faith attributed to the divinity and because it fell to their lot to have new and original experiences fully in harmony with the religious needs, here's the kicker, of their time. The progress of dogma is due chiefly to the fact that obstacles to the faith have been surmounted, enemies have been vanquished, and objections have to be refuted. So essentially, it's the, 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 the modernist will say, and this is why a modernist can tell you with a straight face that he's not a relativist. Um, he is, but he mm -hmm. believes he's not. Because he does believe that things were objectively true for a particular circumstance. So, uh, you know, classic, you know, the book of Leviticus or something with one of the laws of Moses or mm -hmm. um, the death penalty, right? Um, well, th this is why it drives me nuts when people argue for the, for the death penalty. And this is somewhere, we'll talk about neo-modernism in a bit, but a lot of the conservative Catholic apologists out there, they fall into two camps. They're either bending over backwards uh, to explain away all the nonsense, or they're using the same modernistic reasoning of the modernists to try to explain their position. And this is one of the examples. They'll use the example of, um, they'll harp they'll, they'll harp on basically, well, death penalty is necessary because of uh, the common good of the security of society. So there are places in the world today where the prisons aren't that great. You never know if someone's gonna escape, they've proved themselves. Really, that's like number five on the list that's an afterthought of why the death penalty. The death penalty is reasonable and 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 just because of retributive justice. It's it's yes. just simply because it is giving what is due. This is justice. It doesn't have to happen, but it's moral for that reason. Yes. Um, and they'll say, this is why they'll say, well, sure, but we have modern prison systems now, so there's really no need for it. This is someone, mm -hmm. this is using a modernist principle of the evolution of dogma uh, based on the changing circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Darwin. Um, yeah. We're supposed, you know, Father, they tell us, you know, the church, you know, well, this is condemned by uh, Quantacura and Syllabus of Errors, but, but um, we got to get with the times, you know, people are, you know, these, these, this, the evolution's proven, come on, look at it. There's so many scientists that, uh, that believe in it. Well, there's a lot of scientists that believe in, uh, certain vaccines and climate change too. So I don't know why you're not advocating for those. Um, but we can't look silly to the modern world. Come on, you know, the rocks are really old. Look at these studies. Darwin may not have been a good guy, but he had some great ideas. Why is Darwin an important figure in, in this modernist evolution? Um, well, he is, um, he has taken the philosophy of Hegel, which um, basically says that the law of progress is inherent in reality, and you don't need, ex you don't need an external agent, um, someone who acts in order to take something imperfect and raise it to a higher level of perfection. Um, that's definitely required in, in Aristotelian philosophy, the idea that um, um, you need an, an agent, which is already in act, which already possesses a certain perfection, that is the intervention of an external agent is needed to take something which is only potentially um, at a certain stage of perfection and to actually bring it 
into act. Like um, the example that St. Thomas uses following Aristotle is, is water, which is cold in order to be warmed. Um, it needs an external source of heat, a fire or something like that to make it no longer only potentially warm, but actually warm. So to go from potentiality to actuality requires the intervention of an external agent. Um, but for um, Hegel and his philosophy, the imperfect becomes perfect um, of itself by its own internal law of progress. And so that effectively does away with the necessity for, for God. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Darwin simply translated um, that kind of he Hegelian philosophy into uh, the realm of biology, um, mm -hmm. and with the with the aim also of uh, further destroying the traditional um, proofs for the existence of God, because the fifth of Saint Thomas's proofs is from uh, the existence of order um, mm -hmm. in the world. And that often has been developed um, or examples have been given from biology, the, the wonderful order and design, which is apparent in, in living beings. And Darwin um, was able, you know, basically he applied his, his philosophical preconceptions to nature and came up with what seemed like a plausible explanation um, for how you could start with very basic forms of life. And then of their, by their own internal energies, um, by random mutation and natural selection, without the in intervention of an outside agent, they could just become more and more perfect until finally you have things as as incredible as you know dogs, cats, birds, and 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 men. Um, and so basically, Darwinism served uh, to massively undermine belief in in God and society to to render society uh, to uh, render society much more secularized to sow doubt in the minds of people because if God is no longer necessary for the creation of man if man can just evolve from from you know the first living cell and that itself can can evolve spontaneously from a um, a chemical soup um, you know ultimately anything can become anything else as long as you give it enough time. Um, that's the yes. fundamental principle. It's this, this law of gradualism. Um, leave, leave reality on its own. Uh, you don't need anyone to go interfere with reality to make it more perfect, like an, an artisan or craftsman or designer. Um, you just leave things on their own, and with enough time, they will develop into whatever you want. Um, yeah. No problem. And so that's Darwin was able to, you know, uh, sophistically um, yeah. explain away um, design in living beings um, by his evolutionary theory. Um, and so it was only a matter of time before that same method and that same system of thought would be applied to religions as well. In fact, you know, I'm not a Darwin expert, but I believe that he, he speculated in a similar vein about religions, saying that the idea of God um, is something that... Um, how does it work? Basically, it's kind of a, a byproduct, of course, of, of our evolutionary history. And and um, but but that that idea was developed in great detail by certain um, rationalist uh, biblical exegetes. Uh, an important name is Ernest Renan, um, who was a French uh, right. ex-seminarian. In fact, a lot of I think I forget if it's Stalin or Lenin. I'm, I'm pardon my historical ignorance, but one of them was an ex-seminarian. Stalin. Um, Stalin, that's right. Uh, there's a lot of important historical figures who have done enormous damage who are ex-seminarians. <laughs> I don't know why, um, but Renan was one of those. Um, and he uh, read Charles Darwin's work. He was a contemporary of Darwin. I think his the dates of his life are just a little bit later than, than Darwin's, but they lived at the same time. Um, and he was immediately impressed by Darwin's origin of species, and he began to apply similar reasoning to um, Christianity. And he speculated that, well, if you just give enough time, for example, between the historical Christ and the writing of the Gospels, which recount all of these miracles and supernatural events, um, then the idea, the conviction that these, that these supernatural things happened, that can simply evolve through a natural process, um, give it enough time. And, you know, people who observed, I don't know, Jesus um, convince uh, some people in the crowd who had food to share it with other people, um, give that story enough time and it will evolve into a story of a multiplication of loaves um, and so on with all the other all the other miracles. All you need is a little kernel, something like Darwin only required a single living cell in order to say, uh, look at look, look at all of the splendors of, of um, the, the biological world. All of that evolved on its own from a single living cell. And for uh, Renan, it's, you know, look at, 
uh, Jesus had a, an original idea. Jesus said, you know, share share your food with other people, whatever. Um, and all that's all that it took in order to, for the gospel story to develop over time through the laws of evolution um, applied to the consciousness of, of religious minded people. Um, yeah. yeah, it's um, Darwinism requires you to believe that the existence, because there are ingredients, they'll make the thing. Yeah. So my friend, I have a, did a show yesterday with a fellow named Lloyd de Jong. He's South African, and he's uh, been on my show a few times, and we're doing this series on Darwin the man and his beliefs, and it was, well, God rest his soul. I hope he converted or something, but he was a very, very degenerate, very evil, very, very evil man, what he believed, and... Um, it was an atheist, basically. It, it was a fraud. I mean, all these things. But he has this analogy, my friend Lloyd, about, you know, well, I have the ingredients for cookies in my pantry, so give it enough time, and eventually they'll just make themselves. And people say, well, that's not sophisticated. And Well, it's the same thing. I mean, you can add is, yeah. as many special CGI scenes in a documentary with lightning bolts and cosmos and stars as you want to con to, to, to distract people, but it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, and um, now I should say this debate rages amongst Catholics. As far as I can tell, um, well, if I read um, Vatican I, um, I actually have pretty much memorized the phrase, but in the beginning, uh, if any, basically it's anathematized if you say uh, that in the beginning God uh, did not create all things in their own substance at the beginning of time, let them be anathema. So there is, there is room for debate about certain things. Certain things have not been anathematized, but this idea of, of, um, this, 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 the Kantian Hegelian Darwinian evolutionary idea just on basic philosophical grounds is essentially condemned by the church. Um, yeah. people can debate on certain things. Fine. I was reading Augustine or Aquinas last night on the creation and he, uh, he wrote about this in his um, uh, when he was doing his work on the sentences of Peter Lombard um, on the six days of creation. Um, he d yeah, Augustine did not believe in six literal days. He believed in like one moment of creation. This is what's <laughs> ironic when people will use Augustine to say, "Well, look, Augustine didn't believe in six literal days. Therefore, he was fine with evolution." And it's like, no, he actually believed it happened like at the snap of a finger. Um, yeah. six days was too long. You know, the, the, re <laughs> the retelling of the six days was sort of the higher and lower aspects of the, the evening and the morning knowledge and things, you know, to the angels, very, very deep sure. and wonderful exegesis, but it's not evolution at all. So people need to check themselves a little bit when they get into that, because they're, they're using these saints in ways that are totally improper. Um, and, and, and certain, some of these ideas have been condemned by the church. So people have to be careful with that. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a thorny subject. Um, and uh, because Pius XII does seem to allow for some speculation about yeah. uh, a formation of Adam's body from pre existing living matter, yeah. um, while cautioning at the same time that it's not a reconciled with, uh, you know, with the sources of revelation, with what we have in, in Syria and, and tradition. Um, yeah. And you'll find even earlier, for example, uh, there's a reply of the biblical, the pontifical biblical commission under Pius X, I believe, yep. um, which is saying that the uh, special creation of man uh, belongs to, you know, uh, doctrines which Catholics can't call into doubt. And yep. by special creation is, is meant uh, that, you know, God personally intervened to form the first uh, man. He wasn't the result yep. of a, a natural process. Uh, his yeah. creation required a, a direct in intervention of God. Well, and then some of the modernists today, the conservative Catholic modernists who, who promote evolutionary theory, they'll say, well, they, they reduce it to God created the soul. Hmm. And I think there are some problems there. If I'm speaking as a, I'm not a Thomist. I wish I was, maybe when I grow up, I'll be one. Um, <laughs> but um, um, when I read basic Thomistic philosophy, the soul is the form of the body. And mm -hmm. the, the form and the material, I don't know how to put this properly, but even, even yeah. though the matter may right. exist in a potential, so the soul is there when the embryo is created or the zygote, whatever the first yes. thing is. Yes. And even though the matter isn't in its full potential form, in its, in its material nature, the potentiality is already there. Mm. And the yeah, soul is the form. Yeah, the soul is the form of that. So sure. I don't know how you just, we have like an ape-like hominid thing that's like a human and then God throws a soul. That doesn't seem to work. No, no. Um, I, I think that, um, 
you know, uh, theistic evolutionary theories have not all been condemned as heretical, but uh, I think they all suffer from grave inconsistencies and philosophical difficulties. Um, yeah, as well yeah. as just being difficult to reconcile with a a uh, um, taking Genesis at face value. Um, that's yes. Yeah. Also, none of these things are even proven, ladies and gentlemen. They just came out. Joe Rogan. I don't listen to his show because it's usually mm -hmm. blasphemous nonsense, but. He's a famous podcaster and had a guest on, and the guest was an intelligent design theorist from the Discovery Institute, which I know you shared a, a podcast with uh, me yeah, from yeah. there a while ago. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his name. He's not a Catholic, but he's a Christian. Stephen Meyer? It or... was Meyer. Yeah, there he goes. Meyer. Yeah, Stephen Meyer. And Meyer did a great job. I mean, Joe Rogan's a nice, seems like a nice guy, but he's not the sharpest tool in the shed when it comes to philosophy. So Meyer was a genius and, yep. you know, did the genius thing, and Rogan was kind of <laughs> on his heels the whole time. Good, good. And, and so a couple of days later, Joe Rogan puts on Twitter, new discovery, the universe is actually 25 billion years old rather than 13. And I thought this was hilarious because they're using this to try to disprove intelligent design and, and, and sort of a creationist mentality. I'm thinking, but you're not seeing the fact that you've just admitted that they've been wrong for 50 years. And why would mm -hmm. I now trust them? It's the, it's the yeah. same. Yeah. It's this philo people realize people need to realize modernist philosophy goes into every aspect of your life. The reason why you trust the TV when it says two weeks and then when they say two more weeks, it's because you just can't yep. connect the dots. You go late like, people, yep. they, they, you know, anyway, <laughs> trust the science and, trust and that's, you know, that, but that's, that, that's, that comes long before COVID. It, I mean, Darwinism itself, uh, um, was largely a, a question of trusting the science, even in Darwin's own day. Um, when there was perhaps very little uh, evidential basis for the claims being made, um, and and the same thing too with uh, you know there's so many people who lost uh, the faith because of rationalist biblical exegesis. Uh, you know scholars saying that um, you know the the dates are wrong or there's no way that this could have happened the way that you know the gospel recounts it. There's internal contradictions, whatever, um, but. You know, people aren't necessarily losing the faith because the arguments themselves are so convincing. It's because these really smart people um, who devote their life to studying this subject stand up and say, you know, obviously the gospels are are fictional. Um, it's really, the, the I think the greatest damage is done simply because um, scientists, historians, people like that leverage the the credibility that they have with the with the mass with the general public. Um, to make statements that are completely unwarranted by their own research and, and by the evidence itself. Um, but their mere authority as, as scientists or historians um, is enough for th what they say to do enormous damage. Uh, yeah, I'll read a line here too about Catholics need to be really careful about um, using this modernistic way of trying to use the science sort of to prove religion. Um, because here he says, uh, blind they are and leaders of the blind puffed up with the proud name of science. They have reached that pitch of folly at which they pervert the, the eternal concept of truth and the true meaning of religion in introducing a new system in which they are seen to be under the sway of a blind and unchecked passion for novelty. Um, and he goes on to say, these include things, they embrace other and vain, futile, uncertain doctrines. Evolution is not certain. Unapproved by the church. The church does have the right to rule on the sciences. This was made in, clear in the syllabus of errors of, of, of the Lemon Tabulisani of, of, of Pius X and then of uh, Pius IX, another one. Um, she has not ruled on these things. These are not approved per se by the church. Um, and he says, on which in the height of their vanity, they think they can base and maintain truth itself. Um, and another part in the document, he, he talks about how, um, he literally uses the term real Catholic, so a real Catholic should feel disgust if the rationalist thinks that he's doing a good job using his own vocabulary. So if you're going on, uh, you know, you're, try you're trying to talk to an atheist and you bring yourself to using atheistic arguments to try to prove Catholicism, if they give you encomium, he calls it, praise, adulation, mm -hmm. you should feel disgust. But today in the conservative Catholic world, you know, I see these major outlets, you know, evangelizing with evolution. That's one of the titles that they use and things like that. And I'm thinking yeah. you can't evangelize with something that's not improved by the church. Yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy. And, uh, it's, uh, and especially, you know, um, as much as there can be some open questions in, in, in regards to, you know, the, the age of the universe and things like that, um, 
the, the fundamental presupposition of Darwinian evolution specifically that this that the driving mechanism is uh, random mutations um, and and uh, which are then selected the beneficial ones are selected by by uh, survival of the fittest or natural selection um, these the, the idea that that is a sufficient causal mechanism to produce uh, the all of the order in the biological world is just it's it's philosophically absurd and it mm -hmm. comes back to the hegelian he, hegelian claim that that things have an innate tendency to perfect themselves if you just yeah. leave the thing alone give it time it will become anything you want um that's that's fundamentally the philosophical presupposition of darwinian evolution um yeah. and as such it's it's absurd whatever whatever you may find in the geological records um there's no way that darwin's mechanism could have led to the development of new species um, no and there's yeah, there's a there's a million problems there with the stuff and that's whole, another conversation for another day yes, but okay indeed. so <laughs> uh we have a half an hour so we have to fit in this half an hour briefly talking about alfred loisy george tyrell and then i want to say Pius XII talks about neo-modernism because again, modernism is condemned. So it kind of goes underground. He talks about this. You provided me a paragraph there from Humana Generis. Sure. And then I want to finish with, we see essentially the Second Vatican Council prophesied by Pius X and it's in paragraph, I want to say paragraph 38 and we can kind of end with that. So who were, who were these two, two, two men, these infamous Catholic priests who were sort of the fathers of modernism, qua modernism, Loisy and Tyrell? Right. Okay. So uh, Alfred Loisy uh, was a French priest, uh, died in the year 1940. Uh, Father George Tyrell was born in Ireland, but lived, I think, most of his life in England. Uh, he's a Jesuit priest um, and died in the year 1909. So in fact, very shortly after his, his condemnation. Um, and so we begin with Loisy because I believe he started to... Um, uh, publicize his his ideas first, and Tyrell was influenced by Loisy. Um, Loisy, and I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the the name right, but um, that's L O I S Y. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, his story is interesting. So to begin with, as a seminarian, um, he, you know, I, th I think we have an autobiography, but one one way or another, we know that he despised um, his scholastic studies scholastic philosophy in particular which is this uh philosophy uh begun by aristotle and developed by saint thomas and and other medieval theologians and um it's very rational very abstract very dry um it's not necessarily easy to uh wrap your mind around but it's true and that's the important thing <laughs> um and yeah. the more that you nod it uh, the more that you persist uh, the more the more you start to appreciate it but it takes time i mean scholastic philosophy to be fair it's it's not easy and uh, a lot of even you know traditional seminarians when they start their philosophical studies in the seminary they're like what on earth is this i uh it, it can be very dis discouraging so mm -hmm. um to be fair there there's this understandable human element where he was he was thinking this is too dry it's too abstract i don't get it um and so rather than persist uh, rather than humbly admit that you know maybe he's not uh the brightest intellectual light in the world and maybe if he if he just you know cre keeps trying he'll he'll get it he'll understand better instead he he preferred to read authors that were immediately appealing to him mm -hmm. in particular jean jacques rousseau who is an important uh french enlightenment philosopher uh, very sentimental, romantic, um, uh, very bad. <laughs> and um, also, uh, he read the works of certain liberal uh, Catholics like uh, Felicité de Lamine and La Coderre, um, who basically, um, uh, basically, he read a bunch of bad authors. That's that's the bottom line. Um, so he didn't have a very solid formation to begin with. Um, and the night of his, so he had doubts about uh, priestly ordination, about whether he should accept it. Um, he was having doubts about the faith. Um, because he seemed to be talented, his uh, directors, uh, his superiors simply pushed him on and said, oh, don't worry about that. Just just go on through with your ordination. And the night uh, before his ordination, he was just tormented by this obsessive idea. You know, what if Christianity is just a hoax? What if what if it's all fake? What if Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead? And and nevertheless, his disciples, you know, managed to dupe millions and millions of people, billions perhaps, to uh, to believe in him when it's just it's it's not real. It's it's a hoax. That was his obsessive idea, 
Um, nevertheless, he, he goes on to receive ordination, um, but it doesn't get much better from there. He's appointed <laughs> professor of, of uh, scripture um, and his mentor in his professorship introduced him. I, I don't have the name right here, but he, he introduced uh, Father Loisy to uh, rationalist biblical criticism, particularly that of Ernest Renan, who we've mentioned already, yeah. um, as well as Kantian, Kantian philosophy. So um, Loisy was directly influenced by Renan, um, who denied the historicity of, uh, in large part of the Gospels. He denied that that miracles really occurred. He denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, um, and did so with an appearance of erudition of learning. Um, so that so Renan really destroyed Loisy's faith, and at the same time he was studying the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, who gave him kind of an an alternative. If I no longer have objective evidence for my faith, well, maybe I can find a way from the inside of me to to justify my faith, which became vital imminence. Um, and so yes, um, but in fact, to so and and so Loisy he came to the conclusion regarding Jesus Christ that. Um, Jesus himself was an apocalyptic zealot, someone who preached the, the end of the world. Um, and so anything that you find in the gospels about, you know, detailed, um, instructions regarding, you know, moral precepts, the sacraments, and especially the founding of a church, um, all of that would be later additions because Jesus thought that the world was about to end. So he had no intention to, to start a church. And um, that moreover, after he was crucified, his body was simply thrown into a common grave. Um, so it was never even placed in, in the tomb, uh, which is described in the Gospels, but it was rather abandoned. And because it couldn't be found, uh, because it was indistinguishable from other bodies in the, in the mass grave, therefore, the disciples could say, look, he's risen and no one could disprove it. That's, that's basically his theory. Um, and so he just completely lost faith in in even just Christianity itself and even in the belief of God. Um, but he continued to pose as a Catholic priest and to write. Um, and so um, his, his writings were condemned by the church. He was excommunicated in, in 1908, the year after Pashendi. Um, Pashendi already mentioned many of his ideas uh, without naming him. And then because he remained uh, stubborn, he was excommunicated. Um, and after his excommunication, he simply abandoned any pretense to be Catholic or even Christian. He said, um, afterwards he wrote, if I am anything in religion, it is more pantheist, positivist, human, humanitarian than Christian. Modernist. He's a modernist. <laughs> that's what a modernist is basically, but, uh, ultimately. Yeah. That's, that's the end result basically, yeah. you know, because the modernist is someone who, who is tending in, a, in that direction, but wants to stay in the church. So they put up a, a front, a cover. Um, but once they're kicked out of the church, then, then they drop the mask and they show their true colors. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what he did. But Tyrell, uh, the other one that, that we need to mention, uh, he's kind of the other founding father of, of classic modernism. Um, he was not as radical as Loisy um, in the sense that he never uh, openly apostatized or um, even renounced the Catholic faith. I mean, he did objectively renounce it. He didn't believe in the dogmas that the church teaches, but um, he always identified as Catholic even after his excommunication. I think he wanted, you know, like an image of a chalice and, and Patton or chalice and host to be put on his gravestone. He, he always uh, yeah. He, he always continued to identify as Catholic. And so it's actually Tyrell, it seems, who's really developed more of this um, this second aspect of modernism, which is the idea of vital imminence and religious mm -hmm. experience. Um, we have a lot of uh, very relevant quotations from him. Um, but just to go over his bio quickly. Um, so he was raised Calvinist in Ireland. Um, converted to Anglicanism, and then after that to Catholicism. He seems to have been a pretty unstable character. Um, he describes in his autobiography uh, that during his years as an Anglican, um, he still was not sure, he was not convinced of the existence of God or the soul or anything of the, uh, any of those things. Um, and so he would actually pray, literally this is what he writes of himself in his biography. He says that his prayer was, Oh God, if there be a God, save my soul if I have a soul. <laughs> it's just uh you would think that it's parody but that's that that was his disposition of, disposition of mind um he converted after uh, after his conversion to Angl anglicanism he converted later to catholicism and entered the seminary uh or entered the jesuit novitiate and was eventually ordained a priest um but it would seem as a very unworthy candidate <laughs> not not uh, firm enough in his faith and uh reading the works of of 
Loisy and others uh, with similar ideas, um, he, he became convinced that uh, modern biblical exegesis has debunked uh, Christ's miracles, the inerrancy of the Bible, and the infallibility of the church. So effectively, he lost the faith. Um, but um, unlike Loisy, as I already said, he, he wanted to remain an, a Catholic and identify as such. Um, and so he, he really developed the idea of faith as um, stemming from religious experience. Um, and revelation being that that religious experience, um, something that therefore occurs in everyone. He's very explicit. He says that, you know, just as the Holy Ghost didn't abandon the church after the death of the apostles, um, neither has revelation ceased. You know, that's the traditional teaching of the mm-hmm. church is that revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. There's no more revelation. And, and our role is simply to believe the things that have already been revealed. But for Tyrell, um, re- revelation is identified with re- religious experience. Religious experience is our way of, of having faith and entering into contact with God. Um, and so revelation must occur within every individual. And the role of, of um, things like, you know, what was straight, sacred scripture, the, the sources of, of revelation, they're not actually real sources of revelation for Tyrell. They're rather things that stimulate um, a religious experience inside of the individual who then has revelation occur within himself. Um, so he says, to, to quote him, um, <clears throat> he says, revelation is not statement, but experience. Um, so that already says that if, if you formulate a certain proposition, uh, you know, Jesus is the son of God, or there are three persons in God or whatever, um, that's a statement. That's something that you can, you can verbally formulate. And for Tyrell, nope, that's not revelation. Um, revelation is rather experience. And experience is something ineffable. You can maybe describe a certain aspect of your experience in words, but but the words never equates to the experience itself. Um, but to continue with him, so revelation is a perennial phenomenon which obtains in every soul that is religiously alive and active. Um, the teaching from outside must evoke a revelation in ourselves, and it is to this evoked revelation that we answer by the act of faith, recognizing it as God's word in us and to us. Um, were it not already written in the depths of our being, where the spirit is rooted in God, we could not recognize it. So, um, this, you know, go. so I, when I was a teacher in the so-called Catholic school system, um, I had to do a course, a uh, religious, a religious education course. And the book was called, oh, I want to think it's called language of the heart. And it was written by, I forget his name. I'll find it later. He was a former seminarian uh, who left the seminary after the council. Uh, Noel Cooper, that's his name, I think, Noel Cooper. He left the seminary after the council. He was the head of the York region, so that's a major suburb of Toronto for you know, 25 years, religious, religious department there. And he wrote this book. He also wrote a book on, it was called The Sexual Believer, where it talked about the benefits of even teen sexual relationships. This was not used for curriculum, but this was just what he did in his spare time. Um, And, uh, you know, homosexuality and all this kind of stuff. He wrote about that. But he wrote a book that was called Language of the Heart that was used to teach Catholic educators in Ontario. And it was all this stuff. It was... Uh, Jesus basically, and they never explain it. And they would talk about Jesus basically being a healer and the men didn't actually have a demon. He had palsy or something. And I was, at the time, I remember being like, this is dumb because it actually says in the gospel when someone has the palsy and what, like it uses the word palsy. I'm just like, you're not even yeah. doing good. You're not even doing good, bad biblical stuff here. You're not even yeah. good at being yeah. bad at the Bible. Um, but it was everything. It was denying angels. It said directly, man is not a body soul composite. I remember thinking to myself, it's exactly what he is. And, you know, just denied. And this is what they're using to teach. And I, I protested to the university that was running the course. And they kind of went, Ooh, nothing we can do. And uh, I t- protested to the Catholic Teachers Union. And they just thought I was annoying for doing so. And uh, anyway. Um, okay. So um, this modernism is clearly condemned. These people are extreme. This Loisy, I, even the, you know. No Catholic of good conservative sense today would think that that's okay. They wouldn't explain away the miracles and those sorts of things. But modernism is still alive and well, and it was still alive and well in a different form under the time of Pope Pius XII. And I'll read here the paragraph you sent 
um, and then we can talk about how this flowered at the Second Vatican Council. Does that sound good? Sure, sounds good. So this is uh, paragraph 15 from Humani Generis, which is the document for people point to for, for looking to evolution, but read the whole document because that's not really what it says. But anyway, um, paragraph 15. I'll make it bigger so I don't make a mistake. It says, moreover, they assert that when Catholic doctrine has been reduced to this condition, a way will be found to satisfy modern needs that will permit of dogma being expressed also by the concepts of modern philosophy, whether of immanentism or idealism or existentialism or any other system. Some more audacious affirm that this can and must be done because they hold that the mysteries of the faith are never expressed by truly adequate concepts, but only by approximate and ever changeable, changeable notions in which the truth is to some extent Exp uh, expressed, but is necessarily distorted. Wherefore, they do not consider it absurd, but altogether necessary that theology should substitute new concepts in place of the old ones in keeping with the various philosophies, which in the course of time it uses as its instruments, so that it should give human expression to divine truths in various ways, which are even somewhat opposed, but still equivalent, as they say. They add that the history of dogmas consists in reporting of the various forms in which revealed truth has been clothed, forms that have succeeded one another in accordance with the different teachings and opinions that have arisen over the course of the centuries. So I'll let you comment on that in a second, but Cole's notes for how sure. I understand it. The key line here, um, they're opposed, but they say are still equivalent. So... We shouldn't trust our lying eyes. We look at Vatican II where it talks about religious liberty. And then I look at Catholicism of 19 and a half centuries and say, that's not the case. And they say, no, 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 no. This is just a new way of expressing what has developed. What do you say, Father? Mm. Yes, that's exactly it. Um, I think in, in the beginning of the following paragraph, in fact, Pope Pius the, um uh, 12th uh, continues in saying something like, you know, uh, these principles uh, don't only suggest or point to a certain dogmatic relativism, they already contain it. Um, so the pretense, the difference uh, between neo-modernism and, and classic modernism is that classic modernism doesn't even pretend to retain the same doctrine. Um, yes. The only thing which remains the same in some sense is, is that, you know, there's some contact between the the individual person and the divine uh, via via religious experience but um, the dogmas uh, themselves beliefs um, are simply different um, symbols which have a, a relative and temporary value um, now mm -hmm. um, in order to avoid the condemnation of, of modernism neo-modernism affirms verbally um, that uh, dogmas don't change but then says, but we need to distinguish because there's the dogma and there's the way in which the dogma is expressed. Um, and they point to something true, which is that um, there is a, a point of intersection between philosophy and, um, and theology, the way that we express and formulate dogmas and their logical conclusions. You need to use philosophy in order to do that. And in fact, if you look at um, the encyclical, or I think it's a motu proprio of uh, Pope Pius X, on um, the the study of St. Thomas and specifically Thomistic philosophy, um, St. Pius X says that um, once students cease to study and, and learn the fundamental philosophical principles of St. Thomas Aquinas, um, then they will no longer be in a position to understand uh, the teaching of the faith um, because they won't have the intellectual tools necessary to properly interpret dogmatic statements. Um, so it, what, the, 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 what is true in this idea of neo-modernism is that um, it's true that um, religious truth, uh, dogmatic truth, has to incarnate itself in certain philosophical language. And that's why we say things like, I think it was the Council of Vienna defined that the soul is the... Um, is the, uh, the human soul is the form of the body, the substantial form. Um, so that's philosophical terminology. Or again, the Council of Nicaea said that the um, Son of God, uh, that, that, that Jesus is, is uh, God the Son is consubstantial to the Father. Consubstantial, that's, uh, that's involving the philosophical notion of substance. So you can't avoid using philosophy in order to process and analyze and clarify dogma. Um, but the difference is that there's, 
not every philosophy is true. Um, right. And so the, the philosophical tradition, um, you know, founded in a certain sense by Aristotle, but really developed, purified, um, and enriched by St. Thomas and, and others, uh, other Catholics, even St. Augustine had his role to play for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that perennial Christian philosophy is the only true philosophy. Um, and when you try to substitute it, um, with another modern philosophy, um, the result is disastrous. Uh, that's mm -hmm. in fact, what led to modernism in the first place was taking, uh, Kantian and uh, Hegelian philosophy and trying to substitute that for for classic scholastic philosophy. Um, and the result was that the, the nature itself of faith and of dogma was absolutely dis distorted, destroyed. It was no longer recognizable for what it had been. Um, but then the basically neo-modernism says, well, okay, we don't have to, we don't have to stick with that philosophy, but we do, um, agree with modernism in the rejection of scholastic philosophy as outmoded. And so sure, we won't, we won't substitute Kantian and Hegelian philosophy anymore, but we'll substitute instead existentialism, um, personalism, um, uh, immanentism, idealism. Um, that, that's one difference is that um, modernism was grounded upon one specific uh, modern philosophy, whereas neo-modernism is open to grounding itself in any of the various modern philosophies. Anything will do. Anything will do. Um, and that's why it's more difficult in, in some ways to define because it's more nebulous. It's, um, but uh, basically that's, that's what they have in common. Both of them is it's a rejection of, of Thomistic or, or um, scholastic philosophy um, with the result that the doctrines of the faith no longer have the same significance. Um, so it's a more subtle way to change the faith, pretending that it's the same. Yeah, Archbishop Lefebvre would always use the term neo-modernist to refer that was going what was going on to to what was going on after the council. Yeah. And this is how I understand neo-modernism in very layman's terms. Modernism is a heresy. Neo-modernism is a heresy of suggestion, or it's suggestive of heresy. So I'll give you my my way of understanding it. So I'm a father. If I say to my kids, um, Catholicism is not the true religion or not the only true religion. Well, that's clearly a heresy. If I say to my kids, there should be new ways of understanding how one could come to the conclusion that others have true experiences in their religions in relation to the truth of the Catholic faith. That's the same thing. It's the same. Yeah, yeah. I'm just smarter about it. And yep. this is what we find with the ambiguities uh, that come out of the council documents and the, and more importantly, the conciliar paradigm that stems from them. One example is the term subsist. Now I know, is it Lumen Gentium or Gaudium et Spes that it says it? Is it? Um, that's in Lumen Gentium, Lumen Gentium. subsistites. Yeah. Sub, sub, so the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church. People don't know. That's what it says. So it says the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church. Now I believe it was in 2007. That I believe the congregation for the doctrine of the faith kind of came out and basically vindicated the traditionalist worries for the last 40 mm. years. Because I think they yeah. said, hold on, everyone, subsists in the Church of Christ means, or in the Catholic Church means the same thing as Pius XII taught, the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ. But that term subsist can mean more than one thing. Uh, uh, Bishop Fillet was giving a conference on this in Singapore. I watched it the, the other day, listening to it. It's the grammar of the thing, which is difficult, because if, if, if the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, and how does the Catholic Church subsist in the Church of Christ? You know, it's, and so, mm. so even though one could squint and say, well, it's not technically a heresy, mm -hmm. it's suggestive of an opening to the Church of Christ is also in some way in Lutheranism. The Church of Christ is also, in, and again, it's for, I believe, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith did clarify it to a degree, but the document itself does suggest a modernist heresy. Yes, yes, I think even that clar uh, clarifying note doesn't fully succeed in, um, in avoiding at least yes. error. Uh, you can always draw fine lines between heresies and errors. And uh, that's sometimes a, a murky subject, but I, I think that even, even the clarification doesn't, doesn't uh, do full justice to the truth 
there. Um, but I, I'd have to go back and look at the text to, yeah. to really give more analysis there. But um, I mean, fundamentally, your, your point that um, very often there, there is perhaps the same fundamental error as in modernism, but it's, it's more cleverly disguised in neo-modernism. That's certainly mm-hmm. true. Um, and it's also very common for there to be this affirmation at the beginning of a neo-modernist document um, that, you know, nothing that we're about to say here is in contradiction with the church's perennial teaching. Yeah. And then they go on to, to contradict it. Um, but then they say, oh, it's just a different manner of speaking. It's, yeah. uh, it's actually, if you look at it the right way, if you just squint your eyes a bit, it's the same truth, um, just presented in a, in a way which is, um, you know, which, which is more comprehensible to modern man or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Let's that's precisely listen. what happened at the council. I mean, you read yeah. the, the introductory speech of Pope John the 23rd, and he actually makes this exact comparison of, um, of uh, he says that the, the deposit of the faith is one thing, but the manner in which it is presented is another. Um, yeah, and he, right. I think, I think it's him, it's either him or Paul the sixth, but one of them uses the same metaphor of, um, you know, the, the deposit of the faith is like a body, um, and then the way that it's presented, the formula that is used is like uh, a garment that clothes clothing. the body yeah. and you can change the clothing without changing the, the thing that is clothed. Um, so that's always how it works is you say, um, it's, just a, it's just a tactic to introduce new ideas is to say, we're not changing ideas, but we are introducing a new formulation um, to say the same thing, but in a way which is more adapted to modern man's mentality. Um, yes. That, that, that's the tactic, and it, it unfortunately it seems to work every time. <laughs> well, just this, you know, if you do a control F search on Pashendi, and do you, do you have ten more minutes, Father? I've got ten sure. minutes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Ten minutes. If you so. do, if you do this control F search on Pashendi, and you look up the term novelty, wherever there's a love of novelty, you find modernism. And again, Pius X says you can't adapt one of the principles without adapting them all. Obviously, speaking in a general sense, there there are individuals out there who maybe don't see the contradictions in their logic in their in their presuppositions but nonetheless so they are orthodox in most ways but then hold a certain thing and they haven't kind of gone all the way but the danger is always there so um he even says in the document Pius the 10th that anyone who likes novelty should not be admitted to the priesthood yes yes goodness gracious it's like you have to you have so i'm going to read this is a lengthy paragraph i want to read this um I read this the other day, and all I wrote in my notes was, wow, Vatican II. And this is what Pius X says about, um, well, this, this is the, now that we know what happened at the Second Vatican Council and what has happened since, this is literally like a prophecy. And he's talking about the modernist as a reformer. And he says, it remains for us now to say a few words about the modernist as a reformer. From all that has proceeded, it is abundantly clear how great and how eager is the passion of such men for innovation. In all Catholicism, there is absolutely nothing of which it does not fasten. They wish philosophy to be reformed, especially in the ecclesiastical seminaries. They wish the scholastic philosophy to be relegated to the history of philosophy and to be classed among absolute systems and the young men to be taught modern philosophy, which alone is true and suited to the times in which we live. They desire the reform of theology. Rational theology is to have modern philosophy for its foundation, and positive theology is to be founded on the history of dogma. As for history, it must be written and taught only according to their methods and modern principles. Dogmas and their evolution, they affirm, are to be harmonized with science and history. In the Catechism, no dogmas are to be inserted except those that have been reformed and are within the capacity of the people. Pause there. What? Go read the 1992 Catechism. My goodness gracious, compare that to an old one, it's a disaster. Regarding worship, they say the number of external devotions is to be reduced. Think of all the indulgences taken away from the different rosaries by Paul VI. Um, And steps must be taken to prevent their further increase, except for the divine mercy. Though indeed, (laughs) some of the admirers of symbolism are disposed to be more indulgent on this end. So if you think it's good for certain people, that's fine, you can keep it. They cry out that ecclesiastical government requires to be reformed in all its branches, but especially in its disciplinary and dogmatic departments. So that's collegiality. They insist that both outwardly and inwardly it must be brought into harmony with the modern conscience, which now wholly tends towards democracy. A share in ecclesiastical government should therefore be given to the lower ranks of the clergy and even to the laity. That's the synod on synodality. 
and yeah. authority which is too much consecrated should be decentralized. This is there's more. The Roman congregations and especially the index in the Holy Office must li- be likewise modified. They got rid of that after Vatican II. The ecclesiastical authority must alter its line of conduct in the social and political world. So don't start talking about the kingship of Christ and don't demand of the world. Just listen to the world. Listen to the UN. While keeping outside political organizations, it must adapt itself to them in order to penetrate them with its spirit. Work from within, ladies and gentlemen. Go for the Christian Democratic Party. That'll work out. Um, With regard to morals, they adopt the principles of the Americanists. So this is religious liberty, basically. That the active virtues are more important than the passive and are to be more encouraged in practice. So corporal works of mercy, no spiritual works of mercy, even though spiritual works of mercy are actually more valuable. They ask that the clergy should return to their primitive humility and poverty. So this is why priests in the Novus Ordo now wear drapes as their garments for some reason. Um, And that in their ideas and actions, they should admit the principles of modernism. And there are some who gladly listening to the teaching of their Protestant masters Father, maybe you heard about this, but there were some Protestants who instructed the, the, the uh, creation of the Novus Ordo. There were a few of them there. Would desire the suppression of celibacy of the clergy. That's going on right now. What is there left in the church which is not to be reformed by them according to their principles? This, ladies and gentlemen, paragraph 38. It sounds like Pius X knew what he was talking about and essentially was saying the culmination of the modernist reform will be everything we have seen since the council and in the, and in the succeeding years. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing to see how, uh, yes, everything that's unfolded over the last hundred years and more is just a development of, of what Pius X already foresaw and condemned. It's amazing. It's to um, a T. It's, it's literally to a T. Yeah. And, and, you know, these people who are who are destroying the church right now, they pretend to, to, to be progressive and advanced. But in fact, they're just doing the same old thing that that modernists have been doing for uh, well over a century now. Um, yeah. They're not as progressive as they say they are. In fact, uh, you know, and that's that's partly why just on the pure, purely human level, um, the youth is, is naturally attracted to tradition because now to be traditional is the rebellious thing. That's that's the new thing. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, um, a lot of modernism collapses under the weight of its own absurdity and with the passing of years, because it's just doomed, doomed to, uh, to when you make your philosophy, that truth changes. Well, whatever you're saying today, it's, it's going to be dismissed tomorrow. You've condemned yourself to, <laughs> to oblivion. To be well, I have in my notes, I can't find it right now, but, um, I was reading, Something Pius X wrote calling out one of their contradictions, um, basically saying, and again, this is like a prophecy of Vatican II, they say that they need to do this to, for the needs of modern man, but they can't explain why nobody wants what they're selling. Yep. You know, yep. um, exactly. goodness gracious. I mean, you read paragraph 38, you see what they did at Vatican II, everyone leaves the church, and they're like, this is still the thing, guys. This is the yep. thing we need. And I, I'm reading this, and this reminds me of Archbishop Lefebvre and his wisdom when he would say, let us try this experiment of tradition. If, if modernism, if vital eminence is responding to the needs of the religious sense, while me, as a traditionalist, my religious sense needs tradition. So I have every right to that as much as any modernist has a right to you know, drapery on the priests and terrible hymns. Okay, yeah. and and that must be re- if we're being consistent, but they're not consistent, and they never will be. Well, yep, and that's it. I mean, liberalism is exactly the same way in the political sphere as well. Uh, uh, the whole idea of you know freedom of speech, speech and expression, we see how far that goes. That goes only to advance the liberal agenda. But once someone starts to oppose it, um, he no longer enjoys freedom of speech because he's saying things that are conservative or traditional. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's we see it's the same problem everywhere in the political sphere and the religious sphere. But um, yeah. I'll end I'll end here, Father, with one, and then um, whatever whatever you want to say to end off, you can sure, can sure. do so. Um, this sounds like another prophecy of Pius X. Well, it's it's more of him explaining how the modernists will treat because at this time there's no term traditionalist. There's just modernist and Catholic. Okay. After the council, we have neo-Catholic and traditionalist, basically. So um, here is him talking about how they will treat an Archbishop Lefebvre, how they will treat a traditional Catholic. And he says, um, 
Where is it here? Okay. This being so venerable brethren, there is little reason to wonder that the modernists vent all their bitterness and hatred on Catholics who zealously fight the battles of the church. There is no species of insult that they do not heap upon them, but their usual course is to charge them with ignorance or obstinacy. When an adversary rises up against them with an erudition and force that renders them redoubtable, they seek to make a conspiracy of silence around him to nullify the effects of his attacks. So what, what does this happen with the life of Archbishop Lefebvre? Archbishop Lefebvre rises up and he says, hey, modernists, this is stupid. You shouldn't be doing this. And they say he's a wildcat. He's stubborn. He's disobedient. He's a schismatic. He's really mean. He's not a very nice guy. You should have nothing to do with him. And then when he asks for his day in court, it's a conspiracy of silence. They don't give him the day in court. They don't do anything. Um, anyway, this is how they treat. And I see this. I get attacked by these neocon apologists, I, people I don't even know. And uh, I'm like, <laughs> like one fella, he got mad at me for pointing out the n- silly DJ dance thing at World Youth Day. And I'm like, yeah. my goodness gracious, like Father Martin literally spoke at World Youth Day. <laughs> you could, you know, and, but they do their bitterness yeah. and their hatred is on Catholics who zealously fight the battles of the church and no battle was more important than the rights of Christ the King, which is the fundamental doctrine, doctrinal problem, in my opinion, since the council. And Lefebvre fought for that the hardest, and they went after him the hardest. Yes, absolutely. Um, and yeah, thank you for all your work, uh, Kennedy, in, in defending tradition and also Archbishop Lefebvre, his, his honor in, in the face of those who calumniate him. And, and for sure, um, if we're talking about everything that we've been talking about is very general, the way that, that uh, modernism and neo-modernism affect the faith in a general way. Um, but it's precisely that on this question of the kingship of Christ um, yeah. and the opposing error of religious liberty. Um, and because liber- religious liberty was taught um, in a neo-modernist context, you have precisely the same tactic, um, the, the affirmation at the beginning that we're not changing Catholic do- doctrine. And then the statement of new things that have never been said before, um, mm-hmm. but oh, this is just a, a new way of explaining the same faith. Um, but in fact, uh, it's it's not. It's a it's a pretext for denying our Lord's kingship um, and the perennial teaching of the Church about his his sovereign rights over over um, not only individuals but over nations. That that um, all the nations of the earth have to submit themselves to the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so that's just one very particular and very important application of this of this subject. Right. So ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Father, for coming on. And I'm going to piggyback what you said there. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, Angelus Press did put out uh, on audio. It's a wonderful reading of it. They've uncrowned him Archbishop Lefebvre, which they've called Archbishop Lefebvre Summa. Uh, it is an amazing, incredible document, a book on the rights of Christ the King and his fight for that through the council and so on and so forth and after that. And I've listened to it twice and I've read it twice. It's It's an amazing work. Um, uh, pick up a catechism of the Council of Trent or the catechism of um, St. Pius X. Very easy question and, or question and answer format. And um, the SSPX podcast, which Father McGilvery was on various uh, at various times, does go into what we've talked about here in even more detail um, about the various types of philosophy and so forth. So there's lots there. To make sure you don't turn out to be a modernist, because no one wants to be a modernist. Um, anyway, thank you, Father, so much, and please pray for Father. Uh, he's his French is getting better, but they did thrust him in the middle of Quebec with uh, little French. So, um, uh, anyway, Father, it's been a pleasure, and thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure, Kennedy. Thanks so much. Maybe we can do this again uh, after things calm down with the starting of school. Yeah, I hope so. That would be a All pleasure. Right. <laughs> bye bye.